This is a treatment team staffing presentation by William Halstead, Rebecca Sandlin, and Emily Taylor, students at Louisiana State University in the Masters of Social Work program, participating in Social Worker 7010 Differential Diagnosis course. We will be examining case study 16.1 titled A Typical Alcoholic. And we will be exploring the current circumstances and diagnosis of Mr. Matthew Tucker. Mr. Tucker is a 45-year-old white male who came to the appointment after his family intervened to express their concern about his alcohol use. He reported he has been drinking alcohol five days a week since he graduated high school at 18 years old and typically consumes three to five beers per evening. He reported that during the past seven years, his alcohol consumption has continued to increase. He stated he has not had any alcohol in the three days leading up to this appointment. In reviewing all of the symptoms reported by Mr. Tucker, it became clear that it could be divided into two categories. Symptoms that appear to, at first glance, be consistent with an alcohol use disorder and include things like his gradual increase in the amount of alcohol he's consuming, having been able to quit in the past, although not sustain it, for more than two months at a time, and reporting that he was able to stop his use through a cold turkey or lack of use approach. It was reported by Mr. Tucker that he has missed family functions due to being so intoxicated he was passed out and unable to attend, and that he regularly drinks to the point of passing out in his home while watching television. Additional symptoms that were disclosed by Mr. Tucker appear at first glance to fall within a category of alcohol-induced depressive disorder and include things like a decreased rate in food and sex or decreased interest rather, being fatigued and worried, unable to enjoy his usual activities, difficulty returning to sleep. He reported he was waking up in the middle of the night and having difficulty getting back to sleep. And it was also stated that his reactions to stress appeared to be more emotional than they have been in the past. The catalyst that brought Mr. Tucker in for an appointment was his wife expressing her concern about him drinking too much and his increased consumption of alcohol. It also appears Mr. Tucker is concerned about long periods of sadness lasting more than six months. And it appears Mr. Tucker has a desire to address these symptoms as evidenced by his voluntary attendance to the appointment and his expressed um, understanding of the effects that the alcohol is having on him in his life at this time. The treatment team feels it's important to focus on the strengths identified Mr. Tucker, which include his current marriage, and having maintained a relationship of marriage for 18 years, that he owns his own business in plumbing, that he's still able to be productive in his work and never calls in sick. It's a strength that his wife is concerned about his drinking and encouraging him to seek assistance. He's had no alcohol withdrawal symptoms during his periods of abstinence, which include the three days leading up to this appointment and at least two previous attempts at abstinence in the past four years in which he achieved two month long periods of time with no alcohol and expressed having no withdrawal symptoms. It was also considered a strength that his cognition is intact and he appears to understand the effects that the alcohol is having on his life. Regarding family history, as previously mentioned, Mr. Tucker has been married for 18 years. He also has a 17-year-old daughter with his wife. 
It was important to note that no information has been received at this time that there is a history of other family members who have issues with addiction or alcohol addiction specifically. In thinking about the cultural considerations for this case, it was noted Mr. Tucker is white, 45 years old, male. His presumed sexual orientation is heterosexual given he's been married for the past 18 years and has a 17 year old daughter with his wife. His religion was not disclosed. There's no history of disability or challenges that were disclosed in the initial interview. Regarding his employment, he owns his own business in the plumbing industry. And regarding education, he did graduate from high school and then go on to complete two years of college. Mr. Tucker meets the criteria for alcohol use disorder as evidenced by unsuccessful attempts to decrease alcohol use or quit drinking entirely, missing family events due to intoxication, and spending a great deal of time using alcohol. Mr. Tucker also meets the criteria for alcohol-induced depressive disorder as evidenced by his symptoms of inability to enjoy activities, difficulty staying asleep, fatigue, difficulty concentrating, depressed mood, and heightened emotional response to stressors. According to FIRST 2014, the non-pathological use of alcohol would require that Mr. Tucker consumes alcohol on a repeated basis, but with low amount of alcohol actually consumed in a setting and with occasional periods of intoxication. As per the client's self-report, his consumption of alcohol has actively been increased within the past seven years and he experiences frequent blackouts in front of the television set, implying extreme intoxication. In addition, he reports missing various family functions related to his desire for and consumption of beer. Thus, we may rule out non-pathological use of alcohol. This would indicate a substance-induced mental disorder. This would correspond with his central nervous system uh, syndrome of insomnia and increased and unusual emotional reactions to stressors as compared to his past reactions. These facts are what led us to the objective assessment of Mr. Tucker experiencing alcohol use disorder moderate 303.90 F 10.20 and alcohol induced depressive disorder 296.31 F 33.0. Additionally, we assess alcohol induced sleep disorder insomnia type 780.52 G47.00. We have concluded that the client's alcohol-induced sleep disorder is a sleep disorder characterized by a severe change to sleeping patterns enough to warrant independent clinical attention and judged to be primarily caused by the pharmacological effects of his consumption of alcohol or beer on a regular basis. Alcohol is noted for its potential to cause insomnia for consumers. Mr. Tucker reports no other potential cause for his waking up and inability to return to sleep, such as unique and new stresses or medical conditions. As Mr. Tucker reports being able to fall asleep, but wakes up early in the morning and is unable to return to sleep, this would appear to meet the criterion for insomnia type of sleep disorder with the onset of intoxication. Mr. Tucker reports a continued history of alcohol consumption and has been drinking several beers on a regular basis since he graduated high school. This consumption has only increased in quantity within the past seven years. He has been unable to abstain from alcohol use for a significant long enough period of time to be considered to have ever been in either early or sustained remission. When he was able to abstain, it was not in a controlled environment, and he underwent foregoing alcohol cold turkey, as per his words. As mentioned previously, he has met the criteria for moderate severity in his alcohol use disorder. 
An effective assessment tool for substance use disorder is the audit, alcohol use disorders identification test. This test has been used since 1989 and it inquires about alcohol intake, potential dependence on alcohol, and experience of alcohol-related harm. Most of the questions reflect the fundamental relationship between an individual and alcohol. All of the questions have high face validity and they can be used for further clinical inquiry. The range of possible scores for the audit is from 0 to 40. 0 indicates an individual who has never had any problems from alcohol consumption. 1 to 7 indicates low risk consumption. 8 to 14 indicates hazardous or harmful alcohol consumption, and 15 or more indicates the likelihood of alcohol dependence. The Patient Health Questionnaire, PHQ-9, can be used to assess Mr. Tucker's symptoms of depression. The PHQ-9 functions as a screening tool. It aids in making a diagnosis and is also a symptom tracking tool that can track the severity of a patient's depression and the improvement of their symptoms with treatment. This assessment is shorter than other depression rating scales and it can be administered in person, over the phone, or self-administered. Appendix A to this presentation will include a video from YouTube for Health, Defining Alcoholism. Appendix B at the end of this presentation will also include a video overview of DSM-5 new diagnostic criteria for alcohol use disorder at the end of this presentation. Subjectively, Mr. Tucker presents as what might be called a typical alcoholic. He self-reports a continued history of drinking beers on a regular basis since he was 18 years old, and he has increased his consumption within the past seven years. He falls asleep in front of his television on a regular basis. He has missed various functions on account of his drinking. His drinking has caused his wife to express her continued concerns and he has attempted in the past to stop drinking unsuccessfully. Objectively, his level of depression and his dependence on alcohol can be measured through the use of different tests, such as the Alcohol Use Disorder Test and the Patient Health Questionnaire, PHQ-9. The client's self-reporting of his history and increased usage of alcohol, plus his depressive symptoms and insomnia allows to objectively diagnose them as follows. Alcohol use disorder, moderate, 303.90, F10.20. Mental health problems are common with alcohol use disorder, thus leading us to further diagnoses of alcohol-induced depressive disorder, 291.89 F10.14 with onset of intoxication. Alcohol-induced sleep disorder, insomnia type, 780.52 G47.00 We are not considering dysthymia because the duration of his depressive symptoms have been under two years required for a diagnosis of dysthymia and as reported by McHugh and Weiss 2019. He also has no reported history of psychiatric or physical health problems while he does have elevated blood pressure. Alcohol use disorder and depression are among the most prevalent of psychiatric disorders. The V codes in the DSM, as well as the Z codes 
for the International Classification of Disease or ICD 10th edition are listed for further consideration. V61.10 or corresponding Z63.0 discuss relationship distress with the spouse or intimate partner. And in this case, it's noted that the wife is expressing concern regarding the increased alcohol consumption of Mr. Tucker. And we don't know to what extent there has been stress placed on the relationship given those circumstances. We also considered V62.89 with corresponding Z65 point A listed as other problem related to psychosocial circumstances. An example of this would be the family expressing concern for Mr. Tucker's well-being related to his alcohol consumption and him not attending family events as a result of being intoxicated. The primary risk associated with alcohol use disorder for uh, Matthew Tucker is that substance abuse, including alcohol use, is a leading cause of preventable death, according to Wickervitz, Litton, and Legio, 2019. In terms of evidence-based treatment or intervention approaches, Mr. Tucker reports no withdrawal symptoms. There is no indicated need for a pharmacological treatment to manage any related difficulties to withdrawal, according to work of its Legio 2019. Brooks et al. 2018 report that cognitive behavior therapy, CBT1, has been demonstrated to be effective in treating insomnia for persons coping with alcohol use disorder, as reported by Mr. Tucker. For the active addiction, now, Trexone appears to be indicated as an appropriate intervention technique, again, according to Workhevitz, Litton, and Legio 2019. Now, Trexone has been shown to successfully reduce cravings for alcohol and is helpful in preventing relapse, especially when compared to the use of various placebos. Our team has made liberal use of various resources, including peer-reviewed articles and evidence-based uh, information, empirical data, in order to be able to come up with our diagnoses and our treatment plan for Mr. Tucker. The references section will list Ames Center from 2021, Brooks et al. from 2018, McHugh and Weiss, from October 21st, 2019, Medline Plus from August 13th, 2020, Saunders, No Date, Shuckett from 2014, and Witkowitz, Litton, and Legio from 2019 in order to provide the information to help us in our research and our presentation today. Thank you very much for listening to our presentation. Welcome to our webcast. I'm Dr. David Marks. Many alcoholics don't even know they have a problem. So what are the symptoms of alcoholism? And when should you start worrying that you might have a problem? Joining us to answer these questions is Dr. Carol Weiss. She's an addiction psychiatrist and clinical assistant professor of psychiatry and public health at Cornell University Medical College, New York Presbyterian Hospital. Welcome. Thank you. And Dr. Richard Rosenthal, he's chief of the Division of Substance Abuse at Beth Israel Hospital in New York. Welcome. Welcome. So Carol, What's the difference between somebody who's an alcoholic and someone who just likes a drink or two? Well, 
Let's use the word problem drinker instead of alcoholic. An alcoholic is someone who has a problem with their drinking. Either they worry that they may have a problem or someone else has worried that they have a problem. Just that is the beginnings of wondering whether or not you have a problem with drinking. There are some specific uh, criterion that we use to determine whether or not somebody's a problem drinker. Have they tried to cut down and have been unable to cut down? Do they get annoyed and irritable when they drink? Do they feel guilty about their drinking? And the most severe symptom is do they have to have a drink when they wake up in the morning? That's sometimes called the cage questions. Cutting down, annoyed, guilty, eye-opener. That's a sort of very easy definition of alcoholism. But someone who likes to take a drink at dinner, a glass <clears throat> of wine, that's not a problem, is it? It's not a problem if it's not a problem. If it doesn't uh, disturb their social functioning, if it doesn't disturb their occupational functioning, if it doesn't disturb their health, it's not a problem. Okay. <clears throat> Rick, Carol mentioned cage questions very briefly. Tell me about them. What, the, what they are is a sort of set of pocket tools that, that most clinicians should know if they don't know it. But what you can use them for is a, is a sort of a rapid screening of a person to see if there's really a problem around drinking. So if the idea is cutting down, that's the first cage question. What that really goes to is something that we addiction psychiatrists and other people in the addictions field have recognized is probably the most important factor around addiction. We used to think it was sort of the, the, the heroin model, okay, where you, you used to have to become physiologically dependent on the drug and then show a withdrawal syndrome when you stopped it. Um, we've evolved from that. And so if you have tried to cut down made unsuccessful attempts to cut down. Um, that means that there's an issue about you drinking more than you had intended, okay? And so that becomes a very powerful and important symptom. So that's the C. That's the C, okay? okay? The second one is annoyance. And let me go a little bit further than what, what Carol said. It's really more, and not only annoyance when you drink, but annoyance that other people may have pointed out to you, that they think that you drink too much. Okay, so it's annoyance at having that being brought up to you in any kind of a way. Okay, the third one is guilt, which is saying, I think maybe I shouldn't be doing this. If you're beginning to have thoughts or feelings that there's some wrongness about your alcohol drinking behavior, whatever that might be, that's a positive sign. And the last thing, as Carol said, eye opener use of alcohol. If you have to get up and have hair of the dog in order to, you know, get yourself ready for work, you have a problem because that's a fairly strong sign that someone's got a fairly strong dependence problem that they need to immediately upon arising uh, use alcohol to get up to sort of a normal state without going into withdrawal. Well, Carol, if people ha answer positively with some of these cage questions, why don't they seek help? Well, another hallmark of alcoholism is denial. It's very hard to admit that you have the problem or to even realize that you have the problem. Your life sort of starts to develop itself around your drinking problem. So if you start getting uh, to work late on Mondays or leaving early on Fridays, you just start telling yourself that you need a little bit more rest and relaxation, for example, instead of saying, I was hung over on Monday morning from the drinking. Um, also, it's very frightening to give up alcohol. It becomes a friend to people. It becomes a way to cope for people. It becomes a way to have fun. And people aren't so keen on giving that up so quickly. You touched on physiological, physical withdrawal. I think in people's minds, a lot of people think of DTs, right. delirium tremens, <clears throat> with the shakes. It, it happens to people who have been drinking a lot and become physiologically dependent and then usually stop cold essentially and develop within several days usually a profound withdrawal syndrome where people become delirious and lose their orientation in terms of place person and time uh, and can have seizures and there's a mortality rate people can die from untreated DTs but people who have been doing heavy drinking for weeks to months very often even if they cut down may experience withdrawal symptoms they may start to perspire, their heart races, they can't sleep, they feel uh, uncomfortable, uh, they get very anxious, uh, and what will most people do in that state is go back and drink more alcohol. So you end up in a vicious cycle that's very hard to break. Are there any physical signs? People think about the red nose. Is there anything to that? 
Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, not that if you have a red nose, uh, you're an alcoholic, you may be Rudolph, okay? But the, it, it, the, there are uh, physical changes that occur with people who've really been doing very heavy drinking. What I think is even more important, again, is sort of what Carol was talking about, was there may be cognitive changes and there may be subtle. Uh, one of the things we're beginning to understand is that um, as people age, for example, they tolerate alcohol less well. I mean, uh, you know, day to day you may not see any changes, but there may actually be effects on brain functioning in terms of memory, okay, in terms of working memory, in terms of being able to uh, do tasks, being able to switch between tasks. And there may be a cumulative effect over time so that people actually, if they're drinking the same amount year in, year out over a long period of time, they may actually do less well in terms of their mental functioning. So I think that those are the kinds of signs that don't generally show up as often because they're more subtle, but may actually have more effects. Then there are obviously the other kinds of signs that you see that are sort of the classical ones in, 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 uh, in medicine. But when you see people with those kinds, with the big swollen belly that you get from a diseased liver, um, that, that's someone who's got a very severe uh, case of the disease. Um, and is, uh, it's been going on a That's been gone, going on a very long time. Yeah. Carol Weiss, Rick Rosenthal, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Alcoholism is a very severe problem in this country. Diagnosis is the first and possibly the most important step, and we hope this webcast helped out. I'm Dr. David Marks. Thank you for joining us. What I want to do now is I want to cover briefly the new diagnostic criteria from the DSM-5 for uh, alcohol uh, use disorder. Now, the criteria are the same for cocaine use disorder or marijuana use disorder. They're simply changed a little bit to reflect the language of the drug that's being used. Uh, I'm going to really, for simplicity, focus on the alcohol use disorder in the DSM-5. And again, the word addiction is not present. A distinction between alcohol abuse and alcohol dependency, like that which was made in the DSM-4, uh, no longer exists. It is simply called a substance use disorder. In this case, or the example that I'm going to look at, an alcohol use disorder. And uh, let's talk for a moment about the prevalence. This is actually one of the most common diagnoses that's made. The DSM-5 tells us that about 5% of teenagers actually meet the diagnostic criteria for a substance use disorder. Uh, about 12% of adult men, in my mind, that's a phenomenally high number, and about 5% of adult women meet the diagnostic criteria for a substance uh, use disorder. So those are the statistics as to how many people or what the prevalence is in our population. Let's talk about the criteria. Now, those of you who are familiar with the DSM-3 and with the DSM-4 and, of course, the DSM-4-TR, uh, you're familiar with what in the DSM-3R was described as nine criteria for the diagnosis of addiction. The DSM-4 uh, used seven criteria, uh, but there were two that were and or. So it was still the magic number of nine. The choices that were given in the DSM-5 are actually more expansive, and we've moved to a series of 13 uh, different things. It's actually 11, uh, but they've uh, 10 is A, 10A or 10B, 11 is, you know, 11A or 11B, so really it ends up being 13 indicators uh, in the code. So what I've done here is I've listed them out, 1, 2, 3, uh, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and this is actually 11 and 12 and 11 and 13. So uh, th there are a few more things that have been added in the DSM-5 uh, for us to take a look at. Now, over here, what we're looking for really are patterns of use. And so in the category of patterns of use, the first thing I'm looking for is, is there an increase in the use? Does the person use more today than they did before? This is one of those things that can potentially indicate a substance use disorder. In other words, they used to only drink a beer a week and now they're drinking a beer a day. They used to only drink uh, a beer a day after work when they were eating dinner, and now they're drinking a 12-pack of beer a day, okay? So is there an increase in use? My stepfather, I mentioned my father who died of alcoholism, my stepfather is not an alcoholic. 
my stepfather now is, I think he's about 89 years old. Uh, and, uh, and, and for as long as I've known him, and I've known him for over 30 years, I think 35 years, um, my stepfather, his, his entire drinking pattern, uh, the only time I've ever seen him drink is after he cuts the lawn in the summertime. And so after he cuts the lawn in the summertime, he goes out and mows the yard. He'll come in and I'll say to my mother, um, would you like to split a beer, babe? And uh, my mom will say, sure. And my mom, I don't think, actually usually drinks her beer, but she splits a beer with him. And he pours uh, one beer into two juice glasses, and then he has half a beer after he's cut the yard. I've actually never seen him drink at any other time ever, unless it's summertime, and he's cutting the yard, and then he has half a beer after he cuts the lawn. A six-pack of beer lasts my stepfather six weeks, because you only cut the yard once a week. This has never changed for as long as I have known him. And so there's been no increase in use. That's how we know, or one of the ways we know, that Toby, my stepfather, is not an alcoholic. The second thing we're looking for under pattern of use is, have they done things to attempt to control their use? Uh, for example, have they hid liquor from themselves, or hid money, or made alcohol or drugs somehow inaccessible to them? Have they, you know, turned themselves in to their parents or, you know, their spouse so that somebody else can take responsibility for them and monitor them? In other words, is there an attempt to control the use? My grandfather was one who attempted to control his use. To prove that he wasn't an alcoholic, every single January, he quit drinking for a month to prove that he wasn't an alcoholic. That is an attempt to control use. It's also an indicator of the potential for a substance use disorder. The third thing we're looking for under pattern is, uh, is, is there an increased amount of time spent in the pursuit of and or the use of alcohol or mood-altering substances? My, my stepfather, he, he spends about 15 minutes drinking half a beer once a week during the summer. That's the only time he ever spends in pursuit of or using alcohol in any form of it at least as far as I've known for the last 35 years, there's not an increase in time. He's not now spending four hours a night down at the bowling alley or at the local tavern drinking alcohol. So one of the things we're looking for in their pattern of use, are they spending more time engaged in either the pursuit of or the use of mood-altering substances? Now, alcoholics can spend a tremendous amount of time at the neighborhood bar or at home simply drinking. Uh, the effects of alcohol actually last several hours. They linger. When we talk about cocaine addiction, the effect, the high from cocaine, especially crack cocaine, smoked cocaine, can be very, very short. The high can last 15, 20, 30 minutes, uh, maybe at the most for, for some of our clients when they're using cocaine. So what we see is we see an increase in the quantity of time in the pursuit of the drugs and they can spend hours uh, trying to get the best deal or weigh the drugs or make their connections and it's almost as if the action of doing so becomes the distraction and is really the first high for them in this process. So we're looking for any of these patterns that might be present according to the DSM-5. Then what we're looking for is we're looking at symptoms that are related to problems that a person might experience. And the first is, are they beginning to fail at the important tasks of life? Getting to work, getting kids to school, uh, uh, paying their bills, doing the tasks of life. Is there a failure? Is there a breakdown in what should be the easily accomplished tasks of everyday living? And we begin to see an interruption into daily life patterns as a result of drug or alcohol use. Again, one more of the criteria for substance use disorder is met. Then what we see, uh, we're looking for, um, related to problems is continued use despite patterns and obligations not being met. Uh, patterns of, uh, of failure and obligations not being met, do they continue to use? There are many people out there who, because of their alcohol or drug use, have failed to accomplish what they needed to. And when they recognized they were failing at what they needed to accomplish, 
they quit drinking or they quit drugging. But one of the indicators of alcoholism is do they continue to use in the face of these failures? The next thing we're looking for in the problems associated with drug and alcohol use, do they begin to withdraw from life? You see, if I withdraw from life, I can't fail at life. So if I quit my job, I can't miss my shift. If I quit my school, I can't get an F. Do they begin to withdraw from life? If I break up with my girlfriend, she won't complain that I'm an alcoholic anymore because I'm alone. And so do we get, begin to see patterns in their life where, where they begin to withdraw from life itself? The fourth thing that we're looking for in this category here is, um, do they continue to use alcohol despite being in hazardous situations? In other words, there are a number of different examples here I could give, obviously, driving a car while intoxicated. I know I need to drive, but I continue to use despite the fact that I'm going to be driving. This, of course, is hazardous to the person who's drinking, as well as to other people on the road, and certainly a legal problem as well. So that would be the obvious example. Other examples, though, is uh, do they have problems as a result of their drinking, continue to use, and put themselves in hazardous situations? For example... 15, 20 years ago, drunk on a plane got you kicked off the plane. Drunk on a plane today might very well land you in the jail. Uh, there's a, a decreased tolerance on the part of flight attendants for not following the directions that are given. And this is actually a federal crime. And the newspaper seems to be filled with stories of people who, who are putting themselves in legal jeopardy because they continue to use despite the knowledge that, um, uh, that they have uh, social uh, uh, problems and, and failures as a result of their drug use. And then the fifth thing that we're looking for, the fifth indicator is, do they continue to use despite the knowledge that consequences are sure to be experienced? In other words, do they continue to use despite the knowledge that their liver is failing and they're gonna die of cirrhosis? they continue to use despite the knowledge that if they relapse, their probation is going to be revoked? Do they continue to use despite the knowledge that their spouse is going to leave them if they continue to use? And so do they continue to use despite knowledge of important and tragic consequences for the behavior uh, that they've chosen? I do a lot of bariatric counseling. Bariatric counseling is the area of counseling we're addressing obesity and the need for weight loss. In fact, a lot of the clients, if I'm not treating chemical dependency, I'm usually treating uh, obesity. And I sort of specialize in working with these guys that are 50 years old, they're 400 pounds, and they've been ruled out as a candidate for surgery. And if they don't lose half their body weight in the next 24 months, they're gonna die. And this is another area of clients who I have a great deal of compassion towards and who I really enjoy working with. Um, but when I'm working with my bariatric clients, um, they really struggle with the issue of what is called toxic hunger, that craving that is insatiable and they must eat now, no matter what it is or how unhealthy it is. Well, one of the things we see here in addiction or in a, a substance use disorder diagnosis is we see physical symptoms of the substance use disorder. And the first one on the list here in the DSM-5 uh, is actually a craving for the drug or the alcohol, or the analogy I compare it to is that toxic hunger of my obese clients. This isn't simply, I'd like to have a beer, or man, it's hot out and a cold drink sure would feel great, or sure would taste great. This is that insatiable appetite. This is that, that, that that, that emotional as well as physical craving that a person experiences knowing that they're going to find no peace until they satisfy that craving. Now, you and I know that peace is short-lived. It's a false peace, but they believe that just one will do it. And of course, the old saying in chemical dependency counseling, one is too many and a thousand is not enough. And that's the craving or the toxic hunger that the DSM-5 talks about. Now, 
Uh, criteria number uh, 10 in the DSM-5 is actually uh, uh, r related to tolerance. Is there a, an increase in tolerance? And this is one of the early signs of, of substance use disorder. Um, or has there been, is there a decrease in tolerance? And that's really one of the signs of late stage addiction. Now, by the way, when we're measuring these things, we're looking for the last 12 months. So if we have somebody who's been drinking, you know, for many years, uh, they've probably gone way past the increase in tolerance phase. Now they're in the decrease in tolerance phase. If it's somebody who has a, a fast progression with the drug of choice, uh, we may actually catch them here in the early stage. But what we're measuring for is these are all questions that we're going to ask about the last 12 months. The diagnostic criteria focuses on the last 12 months because what we're looking for are recent symptoms that they've experienced so that we can make a diagnosis of substance use disorder here in the present. Criteria number 11 is actually 11A or 11B. So all in all, there's actually 13, even though it's expressed numerically as 11 criteria. And that is, do they have withdrawal syndrome? That's criteria 11A. Do they have withdrawal syndrome? Uh, when they don't put drugs or alcohol in their body, do they begin to have withdrawal symptoms or withdrawal syndrome? There is in the DSM-5 uh, specific criteria for the diagnosis of withdrawal, symptom, uh, withdrawal syndrome. These include shakes. Uh, the, the big book of AA calls it restlessness, irritability, discontrol. It could be hallucinations, just a number of different symptoms. And when we go into the assessment process later on in our training, I'll enumerate those things. Uh, sometimes our clients never experience withdrawal symptoms, though, or syndrome. And the reason why is because criteria 11B. They've been engaging in behavior that is their attempt to avoid withdrawal. So, for example, if I have Bloody Marys in the morning, I avoid withdrawal, don't I? Because I reintoxicate myself. Or what we see, the case of Dr. Bob, the co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, he was a proctologist. He was a physician, of course. And uh, he knew in Dr. Bob's story that he was not an alcoholic because he never drank during the day. But he was taking sedative hypnotics, pills, uh, during the daytime in order to avoid the withdrawal symptoms because of the absence of alcohol. So what we're looking for in criteria 11, uh, we're looking for either the presence of withdrawal symptoms or we're looking for behavioral attempts or substitutionary behaviors that are the client's attempts to avoid withdrawal. Now, the DSM-5 is different from the DSM-4 uh, and the previous versions. The previous versions gave us a category for alcohol abuse or a category for alcohol dependency. That's been dropped by the DSM-5, and what we have instead is we have three categories, uh, either mild, uh, moderate, or severe indicators. So substance use disorder is diagnosed in the DSM-5 in the category of mild. When a client of these 11 symptoms is manifesting uh, 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 two to three of them. So if our client says, yes, I've had an increase in use, Yes, I've been driving my car drunk, and uh, yes, I have this insatiable craving. Well, that's three of them. That would be a mild uh, severity index of substance use disorder, two or three of these things. If my client were to go on and say, I've also had this, and I've also had this, four to five is an indicator of, according to the DSM-5, moderate substance use disorder. And then if our client says yes to six, or more of these than in the last 12 months, then the DSM-5 gives it the indicator of a severe substance use disorder. Now, because we know about the progression of addiction, I've already talked about that progression, Dr. Jelinek's chart, a chronic, progressive, incurable condition characterized by loss of control over drugs, alcohol, and other mood-altering substances. So. Even though the DSM-5 uses the indicator mild, moderate, and severe, 
Those are three words I never would have chosen. I think they're lousy word choices uh, on the part of the DSM-5 because it gives the indicator, well, I have a mild substance use disorder. This is really no big deal. I got a moderate substance use disorder, so it's really no big deal. I don't like these word choices and words have meaning because the reality is if my client says yes to two or three of these today, come back six months from now. I bet you say yes to four of these or five of these things. And if my client says yes to four or five of these things today, left unchecked, left untreated without intervention, they'll say yes to six of these or seven of these or eight of these or nine of these or all 11 of these six months from now. Mild, moderate, severe, they're not the words that I would have used. But those are the words of the DSM-4. But we re need to recognize that all substance use disorder is substance use disorder, which brings me back to what I think the simplest diagnostic tool is. There was a uh, very well-known chemical dependency counselor who was a Roman Catholic priest named Father Martin. And anybody who's watching this who's done addiction counseling for any period of time has come across the literature or the old movies that, um, uh, that Father Martin made about alcoholism. He was one of those people who was a friend of Alcoholics Anonymous early on in its founding and uh, was really a supporter throughout the 1950s, uh, 60s, and 70s. And Father Martin, in one of the probably the earliest educational movies made on uh, the subject of alcoholism, simply said, said this, anything that causes a problem is a problem. And even though the DSM-5 gives us a fancy set of diagnostic indicators and severity indexes to measure these things from, I actually still tend to favor Father Martin's definition of alcoholism. And that simply was anything that causes my client a problem is a problem.